Well, today, I want to close this series by asking you a question. Are you a person that likes traditions? Now, maybe in some circumstances you do and others you don't, but I read about a 42-year-old tradition that caught my eye because this tradition was a little less traditional, in my opinion. It was a race. Now, we think about long-standing races. We can think about all kinds of categories. Think about motorsports. I think about the Indianapolis 500 that's the longest ongoing American race started in 1911. I Once I was able to be a part of time trials there and the sheer magnitude of that race course overwhelmed me. Or if we talk about a race, we can talk about the Kentucky Derby. Started all the way back in 1875. If we think about horse racing, horse racing, then we think about racing in the Olympics. To many, many say that the Olympics started in 776 BC in some sort of form of what we know as the Olympics. But this 42-year tradition caught my attention this week. It takes place in Conconnelly, Wisconsin. Now, the race course is the main street of this small mountain town that's snow covered. The race is outhouse racing. For 42 years, people take this seriously. Everyone in the town comes out for outhouse racing. Now, the rules are this, outhouse must be made of wood frame, must be mounted on two skis, it has to at least be five foot tall, they can't have a motor, and there can't be any way to steer your outhouse. It must absolutely be equipped with a toilet seat, and if there isn't a toilet paper roll on a holder somewhere in the outhouse, you're disqualified. The team... Uh, Teams of three pursue victory in race structures called things like this. The Royal Flush. Too cool for stool. And the colonator. Now, yes, ew, right. But as I'm thinking about this quirky, unusual story from the Pacific Northwest... Uh, it made me think about our offbeat story today in Hosea and how Hosea continued in this wild circumstance of pursuing Gomer. Now, our series, Unyielding Pursuit, is all about God pursuing us. How he continually pursues us for close relationship. Throughout this series, we've been talking about the prophet Hosea. Hosea lived in a time where God's people were basically just going through the religious motions. They were doing some of the things that the Lord asked of them, but they were also worshiping other gods on the side. And God speaks through Hosea, and what I think that we can all agree is a pretty interesting way. If you've missed those first parts of that series, God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. Now, why does he do that? God is painting as graphic a picture as he can about the waywardness of his people and how they put their spiritual devotion in other places. Hosea in this story represents God. And Gomer, his wife, represents God's people. And despite Gomer's cheating heart, Hosea keeps pursuing her over and over again. It's the story of a broken vow, of a broken home, of a broken heart. But God has chosen this very sordid, wild, and unusual story in the Bible to reveal his love and to reveal his grace to us. In many ways, this wild narrative is a good news story. With all of the details that we've talked about, it truly is this good news story because Hosea doesn't stop pursuing Gomer. And when we see this illustration of the story, God doesn't stop pursuing you. 
He doesn't stop pursuing us. I'd have stopped pursuing me a very long time ago. Come on, think about all the stuff in our life, all the baggage that we carry, and God continues to pursue us. We learn that we are pursued to live in freedom. And today we'll be in Hosea chapter 14. That's the last chapter of the book of Hosea. And God lets us know what is in store for us as his people when we respond to him pursuing us. But God's message isn't just for freedom from something. God doesn't just give us freedom from something, but he gives us freedom to something. He calls us to something and gives us freedom and equips us for that. And here's what Hosea has to say on God's behalf to his people. This is Hosea 14, beginning at verse 4. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. People will dwell again in his shade. I will answer him and care for him. God speaking about his people. Now, there's a lot of agrarian imagery in there that probably makes very little sense to us. Not necessarily being an agrarian society or group right here that understands that. But this imagery is a picture of what God has in store for us. So I want to dive in and let's kind of take a look at what God has actually promised us moving forward as his people. First of all, he says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. Think about Hosea's wife, Gomer. She had so much to be ashamed of. And if Hosea wanted her to prove her love back to him, she'd have had a lot of proving to do. It, t- it would have taken a very long time for that trust. But Hosea doesn't base his pursuit on her worthiness. You see, Hosea isn't basing it upon her being worthy of his pursuit. The way Hosea loved her is the way God loves us. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't base his love on your worthiness? Come on. It's not about that. God pursues us. We don't deserve anything from God. But he wants to come and heal our sin-sick hearts. And not just turn us away from sickness, but he wants to drive us into healing and wholeness in our life. I'm up for that. I want that from the Lord. Not just turning away, but I want to I know that healing from the Lord, that spiritual sense of how he brings us to him and makes us whole. Remember the name Hosea and Jesus come from the same root word. This story is a graphic foreshadow of Christ's love for each one of us. Jesus himself was famous for spending all kinds of time with people that others looked down on, outcast, people who were ostracized from society. Jesus scandalized the religious establishment. The other religious people of his day couldn't figure out why Jesus was hanging out with the kind of people that he often did. Jesus pursued people who others thought were not good enough to pursue. And I got to tell you, I'm so thankful for that because in my life, I'm not good enough, but it's Jesus and his heart of love. We're pursued to live in freedom. We're also pursued to live blessed in the Lord. And I'm excited about that. Hosea 14, the blessings from God are described in colorful imagery. Let's talk about the the, uh, illustrations that we looked at or read earlier. I will be like dew. He will blossom like a lily. (laughs) I read that out of context. That doesn't connect with me at all. First of all, lilies, flowers, whatever. 
I don't even like the way they smell. But I'll be like, do you see, as far as weather situations go, do is about as mundane as a weather situation gets. It doesn't get less exciting in weather than do. I can think of movies around all kinds of extreme weather situations. Come on, God, fire this thing up. Tornadoes, hurricanes, storms, floods, some kind of big illustration. You think about movies of Twister, The Wizard of Oz, Perfect Storm, Ice Age. How do you think the movie would go over that was titled Excessive Do? <laughs> Woo! Strikes fear in the hearts of all who attend. I don't think it's very thrilling or very exciting. It might be slightly more interesting than the movie called It's Partly Cloudy Today. Has anyone ever stored up food? Built a bunker in their yard? Because of heavy dew? Has anybody protected themselves? Prepped and put food up for months because coming is a copious amount of dew. Have you witnessed evacuations because of dew? It's going to be bad. Better get out of town. Okay, God, why are you picking such a snoozer of a weather kind of pattern here? Let me give you an example and why. In an arid land like the Middle East, dew was sometimes the only precipitation that they would have for a very long season. And in Palestine, there's a phenomenon in the summer where these huge clouds of vapor would roll in from the Mediterranean. That was essentially what kept all of the plants alive during that season. And God is letting us know it's his divine influence. He's the source of our blessings. He's where those good things come from. And even in seasons where it's dry, he is the provider and the source for our life. Then we read on, like cedars of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. Cedars in this area, typically for every 10 foot tall, they'd have 30 feet down of roots. Those cedars typically go three times as much below the ground as above. In our lives, the challenge is to be so rooted in Christ. More than what everybody sees, more than we, what we let people see, more than what we put on our facade, the roots of us in Christ Jesus are to be deeper than what is even visible. These cedars, they also, the tips of the roots are made to burrow through even very hard rock. They continue to find grip and hold on to that solid bedrock foundation. And here's the thing in, in our lives, my life, I want to, during difficult times, when things are tough, I want to have my life deeply rooted in the solid rock of Christ Jesus. Additionally, cedars, they're resistant to decay. That's why most of us in this place, living in a house, you have a cedar fence. Because it typically resists decay. You can see the spiritual implications of that. As we read on, Hosea mentions, his splendor will be like an olive tree. To me, olive trees, especially large, older ones, they're gnarly looking. The trunks are all twisted. They're crazy looking. And they have these feeble little branches out of this large trunk of older olive trees. Now, they may not be the most attractive to every single person, but I love the fruit. I'm a fan of olives. I use olive oil in my cooking every single day, at least that I cook for myself. Now, as Christ followers, we are also to be ones that bear fruit. And the olive tree will often be green and still be lush looking at times when others have no foliage or look brown. 
Recently, we talked about Galatians chapter 5, teaching us about the fruit of the Spirit. It's not called the fruit of discipline. It's not called the fruit of devotion. You see, it's called the fruit of the Spirit, the, the fruit of the Spirit that comes from Jesus, the power of God. It enables us to take steps to look more and more like him. Catch this. Fruitfulness is the responsibility of God and the Spirit in our life. Our responsibility is faithfulness to him. You see, you don't produce fruit. It doesn't say it's the fruit of Brian. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But in my, what my responsibility is to be faithful. And when I'm faithful to the Lord, that is when the Spirit produces fruit in our lives. Let's keep reading on. Continue on. People will dwell again in his shade. In the Middle East, it's known for the harsh, extreme sun. I tend to love the sun, but pre-sunscreen days and pre-air conditioning, sun was something that you went around protecting yourself from. This phrase speaks to the protection, the restoration, and the blessings that God has for his people. These images we see were pursued also for transformation. Now, many times when we think of transformation in the Christian world, we think of this big club that beats us into submission. I'll get the sin out of you. That's, that's, not, that's not what the Bible's talking about in transformation. Transformation is a process. It's a journey. It takes time. I don't know about you, but I wish God would hurry up with me. And everybody in my life wishes God would hurry up with me. But it's a process. I heard the story, there was a great old story of a man several years ago. His name was Christian Herder, and he was running for a second term as governor in Massachusetts. And he, God was working on his character as he described. He was running for this second term, and one day after a busy day on the campaign trail he hadn't eaten and it was now later afternoon he arrives at a church barbecue and he's absolutely famished from the whole day of campaigning and as Herder moves down the serving line he held out his plate people would put things on and the lady put a piece of chicken on his plate she served him that piece of chicken and he looked at her and said, excuse me, ma'am, I haven't eaten today. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken, please? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm only supposed to give one piece of chicken to every person who comes by. He said, please, I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten yet today. She says, sorry, only one per person. And moves on to address the next person. Governor Herter was known as being a modest guy. He was an unassuming person, but he thought, I'm hungry. Matter of fact, I'm hangry. And I'm going to throw my weight around as governor right now. He said, lady, do you know who I am? He said, I'm the governor of this state. She smiles kindly and looks at him and says, sir, do you know who I am? She said, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. And I'm going to need you to move along. You see, Governor Herder was a man who had much influence. But the chicken lady showed him his influence had limits. And as we talk about being transformed, there's only so much you're going to be able to do with self-control. We need the Lord in, and the Lord often tells us to move along on this journey. Our transformation of taking next steps toward Christ. We see our human limits. We need the Spirit of God. Now, 
God loves you as you are. If I stopped right there, that would still be a true statement. But here's the thing. God loves you as you are too much to not help move you along. He wants to see you grow in this process. A God pursuing transformation where we become more and more like him, more and more like the person we're meant to be, more and more like Jesus. Sun Grove's mission, helping people take their next steps toward Christ. Christ like this is not cookie cutter. It's not exactly the same journey for every single person. We're to continue to take our next steps toward what God has made you to be and what he has called you to. When people are taking the next steps toward Christ, it can be messy. And it's typically really beautiful at the same time. But it's in that mission of God of taking the next step toward Christ that lost people are found. That found people grow. That hurting people are healed. That those that are lonely find community and whole cities can find hope. One area where we've seen such great transformation is through our Celebrate Recovery ministry. I ate on a smattering of applause. He deserves more than that. Come on, let's give that a hand. Celebrate Recovery. I ate with them on Monday night. It was an, an incredible time and to talk, to hear stories. But this year, addicts have surrendered and relied on God. And they're walking through healing. Now, since less than half who attend, attend for reasons of drug or alcohol related issues, we see all kinds of incredible stories because Celebrate Recovery really is an awesome discipleship program. People with past trauma who don't feel safe are finding safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. Relationships are being healed. People are walking in freedom like they've never walked in before. And those that are attending are serving the Lord, discovering that Lord who have, who's pursued them. This past Monday, people sang the line, who pulled me out of that grave that God did. And I gotta tell you, for some that I ate with, that line has never rang more true. And in our own lives, think about our own stuff. All of us have habits and hang-ups that we are trying to submit to the Lord. This transformation is not something that we accomplish on our own. We cannot do it on our own. Self-control will only get you so far. Transformation is a collaboration between us and God. Now here's the thing. God's already done all the heavy lifting. Have you ever carried something where somebody else got the super heavy end and you're there with the light end? Like, oh, this is bad. Woo. God did all the heavy lifting already. We have to allow the power of Jesus, though, to transform us from the inside out. The key is not just to focus on our self-control, but fo focusing on the personification of self-control, who is Jesus. The New Testament puts it this way. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. In Philippians 1.6. It's a process. But a process that he promises to complete. If you're struggling today, can I challenge you? You don't give up on you. Because God is not giving up on you. We look back at the story of Hosea and we see this, that God is not through with us yet. But we look and we see that we're pursued to be caught and to return to Jesus. The story of Hosea, he continues to pursue his wife, Gomer. Hosea married her. She keeps going back to her life of prostitution. 
Hosea pays a monetary price. He paid the price for her to be set free in the life that she got herself entangled in. And then here's what Hosea says in 3.3. Then I said to her, you must stay with me for many days and be faithful to me. Do not have another man. I will also be faithful to you. Hosea pledges his love once again to her and says, I will be faithful to you. We can count on that from the Lord that he will be faithful to us. Living for God is not always easy. It's not always a walk in the park. We have no promise from God that there won't be any pain. We don't have any promise from the Lord that you won't walk through tough circumstances. He does promise to be there with us. He does promise to get us through that. But in this life, we're not promised to not have pain. I no way want to soft sell what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus, being a Christ follower is not an accessory. It's not an addition to your life. Jesus is not our personal assistant. Christ followers are to orient our lives completely and utterly around Jesus. We're to center our life on him. Jesus is the one we serve. Jesus is the one that we surrender everything. Those things that maybe we're proud of and those things that we are absolutely not proud of and don't really want anybody to know. We lay them at the foot of the cross and surrender as Christ followers. He's to be the one that we orient our lives completely around. It's fascinating. We never know, we never find out in Hosea 14 whether Gomer stays in the love of Hosea. We don't know what the long term happened and if she returned for good to his love. But the story of Hosea is an incredible love story that personally speaks to us. Here's what Hosea says. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer your praises. That word, return to God, in the original language, that word is teshuva, which means to go back to the one where you started. To turn toward the Lord. It's also what we use for the word repent. To turn and go back to the Lord. My question to us today is this. God will continue to pursue you and will not stop. Will we stop running and be caught. Will we be caught up in his love, his forgiveness, chasing us down? For some of us, stop running looks like not putting other things in our life that capture more attention, more of our imagination than the Lord. There's places in our heart that only God is supposed to be and at times we can get it wrong and get other things in there. Sometimes stop running looks like trying to stop transforming ourselves by ourselves and inviting the Spirit of God to come in and do that permanent work. For others of us, stop running looks like surrendering our lives to Jesus for the very first time. What does that look like in your life today? Jesus isn't merely pursuing us to turn us from brokenness, but he's pursuing us to turn us toward wholeness and wholeness in him. He says, pray and confess your sins. Let's stop running. Christ's follower in this place Stop holding the Lord at arm's length.
just enough to feel inoculated. <laughs> just enough. I mean, I just want a portion of Jesus. But you know, there's these other areas of my life that I just, mm, those are mine. Christ follow is an open surrender. Every single piece of our life. Say, Lord, have your way. Will we stop running and be caught by him? Whatever the Lord say in your heart, can we pray together? Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in each one of our lives. Lord, I pray that wherever we're at on this journey, that God, you would speak clearly to us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me. God, I want to be transformed by you. Lord, for this church family, I pray that God, that you would do something extraordinary in each one of our lives. God, would you challenge us this way, that Lord, in every area of our life, that we would stop and be caught and experience that love that you give us. With your eyes still closed in this place, maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Brian, I need to, I need to ask Jesus to come into my life. And not only just come in, but I need to surrender all I am to him and make him my Lord. It's an everything thing, but what I can tell you is, it's worth it. The greatest decision I ever made in my life was to say, God, I give you my all. I want to follow you. Maybe you're in this place and you need to pray and ask Jesus to do that. If you're a Christ follower, would you begin to pray for people that are making that decision today, whether that's online or in this room. But if you're here and you need to say yes to Jesus, you can pray something like this right where you're at. Jesus Christ, I give you my life. You died for me. I want to live for you. I admit that I've done wrong. I believe that you died for me. And God, I believe that you are the risen, my risen Lord. I surrender my life to you today. Lord, I pray for every single person in this place, wherever we're at on that journey, that God, that you would help us to continue to take next steps toward Christ.